This video is brought to you by Mubi. Get a whole month free at mubi.com slash do cinema. Excuse me, sir. I'm looking for a job. My motto is, if you want to win the lottery, you have to make the money to buy a ticket. You have to make the money to buy a ticket. You have to make the money to buy a ticket! Jake Gyllenhaal. He's one of my favorite actors working today, and from a very young age, he's been delivering some amazing, memorable, and relatable performances. I wouldn't say he's an underrated actor, but in my opinion, his work doesn't quite get the recognition it deserves. Good morning, Pete. <laughs> So in this video, we're going to be discussing his filmography, from his least famous roles to the most famous ones, and find out what makes Jake Gyllenhaal such a great performer. And seeing as I'm going to be saying his name a million times, like I did with Ryan Gosling, let's start with the elephant in the room. The name Gyllenhaal, I never know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, it is a Swedish name, is it not? It is a Swedish name. So yeah. shouldn't it be like Gyllenhaal? Oh my god. <laughs> I have to say Gyllenhaal. <laughs> The only two places that that is pronounced correctly, my last name like you did just now, is in Sweden uh -huh. and in Ikea. <laughs> Ikea! <laughs> so, who is Jake Gyllenhaal? Jacob Benjamin Gyllenhaal was born on December 19th of 1980 in Los Angeles. Because his father was a director and his mother was a screenwriter, he was exposed to the art of filmmaking very early on in his life. His sister, Maggie Gyllenhaal, is also an actress who you might know from playing Rachel in Batman The Dark Knight, and also plays his sister in Donnie Darko. When Jake was 11, he made his acting debut showing off his shoulder-popping skills in the comedy movie City Slickers, and after that started making appearances in a few of his father's movies. Some interesting facts, Gyllenhaal was named one of the 50 most beautiful people by People magazine and was selected as the sexiest man of 2018. I mean, you can't deny it, bro looks majestic. He also dated Taylor Swift, who made a few songs about him after they broke up. He dropped out of university after studying Eastern religions and philosophy to focus on his acting career. And last but not least, he was a among the top picks to become Batman and Spider-Man. I, I auditioned for a lot of classics that I didn't, I'm not in. <laughs> However, there's a lesson in that. Even though he did later play in some blockbusters like Day After Tomorrow or Prince of Persia and eventually Mysterio in Spider-Man, those are not his best performances. Instead, he played in a lot of independent arthouse films. And that's exactly where his power lies. These more challenging roles like Brokeback Mountain, Donnie Darko, Nightcrawler, End of Watch and many more gave him the opportunity to experiment and grow tremendously as an actor. We saw this with Robert Pattinson as well, who for some time only wanted to take on independent productions like Good Time, High Life and The Lighthouse. It's almost like the lower the box office of Gyllenhaal's movies, the better the performance gets. So let's shine some light on his career, check out his best performances over the years and see the full evolution of Jake Gyllenhaal. Jake had two major breakthrough roles at the beginning of his career, October Sky and Donnie Darko, showing two different sides of him. October Sky was an immediate hit, telling a wholesome story about a boy's passion for rocket science. Donnie Darko, on the other hand, was the complete opposite. It wasn't a box office success on its release, and it tells the story of a psychologically troubled teenager. And then Donnie Darko came up and I was like, oh, this feels like my high school experience. <laughs> But when people became tired of seeing the typical high school stories a few years later, Donnie Darko became a cult classic. These two movies laid the foundations for Jake's acting style, because it's oftentimes the subtleties of his facial expressions and the use of his luscious eyes in his performances that we will see a lot more of in his later films. I started looking at the rabbit, my sort of chin down, looking at him in a particular way. I think because of the angle of where the camera was in the close-up, and then eventually became you know, a choice that my character made every time he saw the rabbit. And it's those little things that I've learned to trust over time, those little weird instinctual things character-wise that I go, oh, why is that showing? Oh, I'm gonna use that, you know. To develop his range as an actor even more, he went on to play in theater. To quote himself, every actor I look up to has done theater work, so I knew I had to give it a try. He practiced with different accents, learned how to sing, and fast forward to the present, he has played on the biggest stages like West End and Broadway. Now, during his teenage years, he also made a few romantic dramas playing an emo kid working in a supermarket. And then, something magical happened. You know how Shakespeare created Hamlet, Homer wrote The Odyssey, while Jake Gyllenhaal created Bubble Boy. This movie is really wild, and it's basically one big meme. <laughs> But it was actually so good that they had to bring it back for his role as Mysterio in Spider-Man Far From Home. Wait a second, I've seen this before. 
Yeah. Yes. I know. Fun. It's not Bubble Boy anymore. It's hey, Bubble Man. Bubble Man. <laughs> oh, snap. <laughs> In 2002, he had a quick dinner with Jared Leto, aka Paul Allen, in the movie Highway, before starring in his first blockbuster movie, The Day After Tomorrow. <laughs> Another martini, Paul. His career took a turn in 2005, because this is when we start seeing him take on more risky decisions as an actor and just roles with them, showing the world that he can play any character convincingly. Brokeback Mountain is often jokingly referred to as the gay cowboy movie, but it is more than that. It was a pivotal moment for Jake. He played a gay character for the first time together with Heath Ledger, which was quite a bold career decision. When was it, 10 years ago? A lot of actors didn't want to play a gay role. Now everybody does. Um. <laughs> he knew he was going to take part in a very important story. However, in this interview, he explained that he didn't fully realize the impact it would have when it was released. A story has the power beyond anything that you think you have control over or part of. The story is the power. And when it goes out into the world, it becomes everyone else's. And so you have a short time with it, and that's my job and my honor to do, and then it is everyone else's. The movie received three Academy Awards and earned Jake his only Oscar nomination ever for Best Supporting Actor. Criminal, right? It's after this movie that Jake realized the true power a story can have and started working even harder on reaching his true potential as an actor. So this is where all that power is coming from. Interesting. Jarhead. This movie planted a seed. Not only is it the first of many movies where Jake takes an angry shower by himself and rethinks life, it's also the first of many military or police related movies he later plays in, such as End of Watch, Zodiac, Prisoners, Brothers, The Guilty, and his latest movie, The Covenant. The reason he is drawn to playing military figures is not only because he expresses great admiration for their bravery, but in terms of acting he is drawn to roles of people operating under extreme circumstances, as it brings out the humanity in people. In Jarhead he delivers a very raw performance showing the emotional toll on an individual of living in such a disturbing environment. In Brother, staring Tobey Maguire, we see him dealing with the PTSD of his brother after fighting in Afghanistan. But for End of Watch he took it a step further and actually worked as a police officer in LA for several months, training with officers and even accompanied them to crime scenes. And what I saw just changed me forever. To see the work that they do, to be with them watching them do their work, to be in sometimes very dangerous situations and also beautiful situations, to see human behavior at its most tried sometimes changed everything in the way I see the world. So I look at that as a very, very particular moment in my life and my career, something I needed. In 2021, he played in The Guilty, which is another really intense role playing an isolated 911 police dispatcher. And in 2022, he starred in Ambulance by Michael Bay, which is basically a two-hour, five-star GTA chase in an ambulance. Now, with the movie Zodiac, another seed was planted, because Jake later masters the genre of the psychological thriller, such as in Prisoners, Enemy, Nightcrawler, and Nocturnal Animals. It's on this film that Jake learned that filmmaking is a director's medium, and that actors serve the director especially in the case of David Fincher, who is known for pushing his actors to the extreme. It's raining and I run up to this door and um, I'm trying to get information and we shot the scene twice and we shot it probably over, I had 50 takes of it. I remember I never really got that scene. And if I did, or if he did, I never did, which is an interesting thing as an actor. One hilarious fact about this movie is that for the close-ups of Jake's knuckles, David Fincher added some hair with CGI because he thought that Jake's hairless knuckles looked too perfect. The thing that Jake does best is his dedication of carving out the characters and fully embodying them, a technique called method acting, in which an actor strives for complete emotional identification with a character. And what's next is probably the greatest trilogy of back-to-back -back peak performance, Prisoners, Enemy, and Nightcrawler. Prisoners. Ryan Gosling actually auditioned for the role of Detective Loki, and to be honest, Officer K would have worked just as well. Jake and Ryan are two actors that perfectly play characters that are indifferent and emotionally dislocated. They both have this humoristic, goofy, yet stoic personality that makes them literally me. But Villeneuve went with Jake in the end because he had experience as a policeman from his previous movies, and introduced a whole backstory for the character. 
He came up with facial tics to show the stress of the character and little details like tattoos and jewelry to make him seem like a real person. Those subtle performances, especially the use of his bright blue eyes, is what sets him apart. In Donnie Darko, he used his sleepy eyes combined with the Kubrick stare to show his madness. He used the eye twitch in Prisoners to indicate stress. He literally never blinked in Nightcrawler, having his eyes wide open like a hungry coyote. And in Nocturnal Animals, the constant devastation in his red, teary eyes are juxtaposed with his happy, bright eyes when life was still good. The eyes, Chico. They never lie. Enemy. In Enemy, Jake took method acting so far that he literally became himself playing his own doppelganger. Really impressive as he plays both main characters very distinctly from one another, all while not trying to be his actual self. Nightcrawler. I've seen this movie like, what, four times now and as a cameraman myself, I think of this movie every time I'm on the job. Jake's pre-production research included heading out after dark with this man, Howard Reshbloom. I'm an adrenaline junkie, I love the breaking news. He's a real life Los Angeles nightcrawler who for 15 years has been roaming these streets and selling his video. He started living a lot at night like a werewolf and put himself on a salad diet to look like a hungry coyote. Lou Bloom plays these characters like chess, manipulating them for his own good, no matter the costs. The ad didn't say what the job was. It's a fine opportunity for some lucky someone. Oftentimes, like in his later movie Stronger and Nocturnal Animals, he starts off playing this charming guy, but over time we see him get more caught up in himself until he explodes and reveals his true side. The performance was so real that a piece of Lou Bloom might still be left inside of him. I was just deeply devoted to that character and that story. And yeah, the, the side effects of it, it's like, it takes a bit of time to shake it off, but you know, in the end, it's just acting. You know what that reminded me of? How long do the characters stay in your head? Do they ever leave? I don't know, really. All jokes aside, if something like this doesn't deserve an Oscar, or at least a nomination, I don't know what does. But it didn't stop there. To shake off the disappointment of not receiving an Oscar nomination, he went on to play a boxer fighting his way back to the top in Southpaw. The physical transformation from Nightcrawler to this is insane, but more importantly, the preparation shows his discipline and mindset as a great actor. Jake and I trained eight hours a day, you know, for a month and a half, two months. Lived like boxers, uh, clean diet, clean lifestyle, didn't go out. I mean, I'd get to the gym, you know, thinking I'd be the first one there and he'd already run like seven miles. You know, and learning the choreography and all that, yeah, it was, it was intense. I think I look at it, all those things as a challenge and you get to learn a new skill and I thought, if I work really hard, I might not look like a fool, you know? <laughs> so I just tried to work as hard as I could. He wasn't joking when he said, What I believe, sir, is that good things come to those who work their asses off and that people such as yourself who reached the top of the mountain didn't just fall there. The boxer's mentality stuck with him over the years and he is currently filming a UFC movie titled Roadhouse, which was partially shot during breaks of actual UFC fights. Jake loves a good challenge and to push himself even further he filmed on the slopes of Mount Everest and then he went on an adventure together with Bear Grylls. Uh, yeah, it's uh, pretty high. But pushing yourself this far eventually takes its toll. According to Jake, he pushed himself over the edge for the movie Stronger. This time not physically, but on a purely psychological level. Playing a character who has lost his legs in a bombing that is based on a true story. You just have to show up for Show once. up! Yes! Show up? Yes! I fucking showed up for you! I showed up! I was standing there for you! Oh. I can't do it! Why do you even want me? Why? I'm such a fuck up! Acting is like all about imagination. And there's a lot of talk about like, oh, commitment and, um, uh, you know, method acting and, you know, how far do you go and blah, blah, blah. It's everybody's favorite conversation. But it is a conversation that's had a lot. And I just believe so deeply in your imagination. That's the fun. It's like the play. It's what you need. And I had lost it in that moment. And, I, and it, it threw me for a number of days because I went so far. And I just realized that I, I, that's not acting to me anymore. In recent years, Gyllenhaal's choices don't suggest an obsession with Academy recognition. He seems to be more focused on playing characters that represent a challenge for him while also feeling true to himself. Working with directors he has worked with, such as Dan Gilroy from Nightcrawler, who wrote the script for Velvet Buzzsaw. What do you mean my reviews have fallen off? You don't know what you like or even want. I'll tell you what I did like. Also, reuniting with actors such as his buddy Riz Ahmed from Nightcrawler. 
Ooh, we know each other. Uh, no, I don't think so. Or with actors he has worked with turning into directors such as Paul Dano from Prisoners for his debut titled Wildlife. And working with completely new directors like Bong Joon-ho for Okja who created Parasite. But most importantly, it was also time to throw out all the seriousness and have fun again. See, that wasn't so hard. <laughs> yes! Somebody get this stupid costume off me! It is easy to question the projects that Jake has chosen in the last few years, but despite this, the quality of his performances have never really been lacking. Till this day, I think Demolition and Nocturnal Animals are his most underrated performances, while also being among the lowest box office movies of Jake. In Demolition, he plays a man who tries to turn his life around after his wife passed away, but one day he decides to stop whining, goes out and touches some grass, starts destroying his old house, and begins working on himself to become a new man. And Nocturnal Animals, directed by fashion guru Tom Ford, is a movie that manages to kind of reach the Nightcrawler type levels. An unrequited love story mixed with the ambience of No Country for Old Men staring Jake Gyllenhaal on a quest to take revenge. It's in these type of movies that Gyllenhaal is at his best, when a capable director knows how to use him and when he gets the freedom to add layers to the story. This is why he's often credited as a producer as well, and started his own production company to fund movies in order to let other people tell their story. Gyllenhaal has proven that he can literally play any type of character, from playing in comedies and fantasy to psychological thrillers and Broadway productions. But what makes his performances feel so real is that he puts a lot of time and effort into figuring out who his characters are off screen. From the way they talk, to the way they walk, even to the way they blink, building a full picture that he can then deconstruct for the audience and build it back up. And that is what makes Jake Gyllenhaal such a great performer. But remember, I will never ask you to do anything that I wouldn't do myself. And what I believe, sir, is that good things come to those who work their asses off. So no matter how the Academy decides to treat him, he will always be the Jacobs Gyllenhaal of them all. To kickstart your greatest Jalen Hall journey, check out the movie podcast and their season Needle on the Record, which has an entire episode on the music in Donnie Darko, including its cover of Tears for Fears' Mad World. The season looks at stories behind some of cinema's most iconic movie music moments, and you can listen to the show wherever you get your podcasts. And to check out some of Maggie's work, Lenny Abrahamson's Frank is streaming on Mubi in the US, or Spike Jones' Adaptation is streaming in the Netherlands. Mubi is a curated streaming service dedicated to elevating great cinema, a place to discover ambitious new films and singular voices from iconic directors to emerging auteurs. And the best thing is that they are all carefully handpicked by movie curators, streaming anytime, anywhere. We work anytime, anywhere. We work Jewish holidays? Anytime, anywhere. You can try movie free for 30 days at movie.com slash do cinema. That's mubi.com slash do cinema for an entire month of great cinema for free.